To survive and flourish, religions and their leaders must adapt to changing circumstances while seeking to retain their core principles. Over the long period from the 3rd century BCE to the 8th century CE, Brahmins gradually built up their prominence in Indian society. To do so, they developed their models of and for the universe and society into what is today called Hinduism. In this process, Brahmins absorbed many of the most attractive features of their rivals, particularly Jainism, Buddhism, and popular movements centered on particular gods and goddesses. As you'll recall, from the 3rd century BCE onward, the new religions of Jainism and Buddhism taught nonviolence, an alternative path to the Vedic model based on sacrifice. These newer religions attracted kings of non-royal origin, especially the Mauryan emperors, as well as rising classes of Indian society, especially merchants. Brahmins, for their part, strengthened their religious leadership. They expanded upon the sacred Veda, which had, in Edic terms, been compiled starting over a millennium earlier. Society had changed greatly as Vedic pastoralists largely settled down to become farmers or town or city dwellers starting around 500 BCE. So the specific words of the Veda no longer related to their lives, although its sacred sounds remained unchanged and powerful. However, Vedic Sanskrit had become an archaic language. Even educated speak people spoke a later form of Sanskrit or a Sanskrit-derived language. As a result, Brahmin teachers increasingly interpreted the Veda into forms that the vast majority of the population of India found more compelling. Brahmins co-opted some of popular devotionalism, called bhakti. They highlighted specific Hindu gods and goddesses as objects of puja, or worship. Brahmins proved especially successful under rich, powerful, and culturally sophisticated patrons like the Gupta Empire of the 4th to 6th centuries CE. Since many of the core features of what we will call Hinduism consolidated during this period, we'll use that term from now onward, although it is still somewhat anachronistic to do so, since the term was not actually used widely until much later in India's history. Over many centuries, Brahmin scholars composed in the Sanskrit of their day a series of formal teachings, or shastras. These teachings linked the Veda with explanations and rules for most aspects of living people's lives. The main shastras largely reached their highest state during the period of the Gupta Empire. Although the male Brahmin author of each individual shastra identified it as an elaboration of the Veda, these lessons responded to many of the new challenges posed by rival religions and movements, thereby addressing stresses within their contemporary society. The major shastras or manuals were composed by Brahmins successfully re-exerting their influence over the hearts and minds of most Indians. And the shastra genre has proved useful ever since as a way to convey ideals about some aspects of life or a particular field relevant to the surrounding Indian society. The prescriptive models asserted by the authors of these shastras were never fully implemented, so they do not exactly describe society. But while they remained ideals held by their Brahman authors, these shastras do provide Edic historians with much richly detailed and unmatched source material about the ancient Indian history. The Shastras are emically classed as Shmurti, that is, remembered knowledge or tradition, the product of divinely inspired but human authors. This genre is therefore less sacred than the Veda, which is regarded as uncreated truth, the universe in sound form. Also, the teacher authors of these Shastras did not all agree. So there are different versions of the same Shastra, Indeed, some authors explicitly discuss the weaknesses of Vedic interpretation and teachings of other Shastric authors. Over time, some versions of a Shastra became more authoritative than others. 
This was often because they provided models and answers that audiences found most persuasive. Nonetheless, they all share most of the same ideas about the nature of the genre and the ideals of society. In its model structure, each Shastra begins with devout students reverently approaching their semi-divine teacher with a deep question. This question is about the nature of the universe in general, but in particular about the origin and appropriate roles of people with special respect to that specific aspect of life. The Dharma Shastra, for instance, has students wanting to know the origin of each of the four Varnas and of the thousands of Jatis and the duties, that is, Dharma, for men and women in each of these. In response to his students' questions, the semi-divine teacher then elaborates based on his complete comprehension of the Veda. The teacher thus provides commentary that makes the lessons relevant to the contemporary society and concerns of his students. This question and response is a powerful rhetorical strategy used by many cultures around the world. To illustrate what the Shastras say and how they convey their teachings, we'll look at the three main Brahmanic Shastras. Each one deals with a different aspect of Indian society of its day. These present, first, the science of morality, that is, Dharma. Second, the science of material power, that is, Artha. And third, the science of sensual pleasure, that is, Kama. When applied expertly, each of these sciences leads to moksha, that is, to release from the cycle of rebirth and redeath, according to most Hindus. There are also other less widely applicable shastras about specific professions, including a manual of the performing arts of drama, dance, and music, the Natya Shastra, a manual for architecture, the Vastu Shastra, and a manual for sculpture, the Shilpas Shastra. Dharma stands as the highest path toward moksha. It is also the path that its authors and audience have found most widely relevant since it addresses many of the social patterns and tensions of its era. It also tells Eddic historians about the culture and society that produced this text, so it deserves our most thorough analysis. As with the other Shastras, there were many versions of the Dharma Shastra. The version that has become most widely used is attributed to a legendary semi-divine figure, Manu. The name Manu, meaning man, appears in various parts of the Brahmanic tradition, often used for the male ancestor of all Indians. So the name Manu may not refer to an individual author, but rather to the abstract concept of an almost superhuman sage and progenitor from much earlier times. Many people who contributed to the composition of this text attributed to the legendary teacher Manu. Therefore, this most influential version of the Dharma Shastra is often titled in English translation as the Laws of Manu. Indeed, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which currently governs the Republic of India in 2016, is sometimes criticized as the party of Manu, since its opponents accuse it of favoring high-born Hindus and this Dharma Shastric model for society. We have seen that over the late Vedic period, Brahmins had developed three broad paths. First, some performed Vedic rituals for themselves in their households, or often more elaborate ones for patrons. Second, other Brahmins withdrew from society and went into the forests, either actually or symbolically, in order to speculate about the cosmic issues of existence. The Upanishads and Aranyakas, or esoteric and forest books, books of the late Veda reflect this path. Third, yet other Brahmins took to asceticism in order to devote themselves fully to attaining release, moksha. We saw in a previous lecture that Jain monks and nuns also became ascetics. There is evidence, however, of tension among these three Brahman paths, as each considered its own way the highest. The Dharma Shastra provides room for all these three different ways of life, the householder, the forest dweller, and the wandering ascetic, honoring each in turn. 
To do so, the Shastra prescribes different ashramas or life stages. Each ashrama is initiated by a specific rite of passage, a samskara, which transforms one into the next stage or level of existence. In the classic Dharma Shastra model, children do not have full status as members of human society until they have been initiated. In many religious traditions around the world, a similar pattern of initiation into personhood has been practiced, like baptism in many Christian traditions, or bar or bat mitzvah for Jewish people. For the Dharma Shastra, this initiation was a major rite of donning the sacred thread that makes one twice born. This sacred thread is a ritually constructed white cotton cord around the torso, draped from the left shoulder across the chest and back with the lowest portion at the right waist. Once donned, this sacred thread has to be kept pure and periodically renewed. Reflecting the perspective and authorship of the Dharma Shastra in Enoch terms, only men born of Brahman, Kshatriya, or Vaishya parents can receive this sacred thread. The boy has to be mature enough to undergo this ritual, and not all are ready by birth or personality at the same time. So the Dharma Shastra specifies that the sons of Brahmins will be generally ready to receive this thread at an earlier age than the sons of Kshatriyas and they before Vaishyas. The standard for a Brahmin boy is eight years after conception, which is the way that culture defines the moment of life beginning. For a Kshatriya boy, it's age 11, and for a Vaishya, age 12. But a particularly precocious Brahmin might begin much earlier, as young as age 5, while a less mature Brahmin could be as old as 16. Today in India, twice-born men total only about 10% of the population. So we can see how the authors of this Shastra particularly addressed a small male elite. In the Shastra, girls and the sons of Shudras, or people ranked by Brahmins below Shudras, like so-called outcasts and Adivasis, are never considered capable of undergoing this ritual. Further, the sons of Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas, who do not undergo this sacred thread ritual in time, also become outcasts automatically. Once initiated, a twice-born man should study the Veda under worthy Brahmin teachers, called gurus, meaning people heavy with knowledge. The student must remain celibate, live on food given freely by donors, and be fully obedient in the service of his teachers. Again, different students have different abilities, so the length of time that one lives as a student varies. Some devote much of their lives to the student stage of life. The Shastra prescribes 36 years of Vedic study as ideal, but other students pass through this stage more rapidly. Since every small portion of the Veda carries the sacred power of the whole, some twice-born boys complete this first stage of life very rapidly, for example, by learning only a small fragment of the Veda in just a few hours. The Dharma Shastra prescribes the next major rite of passage as marriage for men and women of all Varnas. Hence, it is the second samskara for twice-born men, but the first for everybody else. Since the Shastra identifies Varna as the fundamental unit of society, all of life, especially marriage, should perpetuate the purity of each Varna. Thus, twice-born men are directed to marry women of their own Varna who are worthy of them. She should be a virgin, physically auspicious and healthy, and from a religiously observant family, not incestuously related, and from one that has a proven record for producing many sons. It appears somewhat acceptable for a woman to marry upward what is called by Eddic anthropologists hypergamy. She is transformed by the wedding rite of passage into the family of her husband. So if he, if he is of a higher status, she rises. But in the Shastra, there are limits on how much higher she can go. Within Avarna would be fine. 
A woman can even marry a man of a higher varna, but never as his first wife, only as a secondary one. However, such inter-varna marriages have detrimental effects on both the husband's status and also the identity of their children. According to this Shastra, such inter-varna offspring are members of a jati that has some characteristics of each parent and are thus not full members of the father's varna. We know from historical and ethnographic evidence that some jatis were created or perpetuated in this way. For example, the child of a kshatriya father and a mother who was the daughter of Brahmins was part of a chariot driver jati called Sutta, who ranked below kshatriyas but served them. But the Shastra uses such inter-varna marriages to explain the origins of all jatis out of the mixing of the original four varnas. This emic theory far overstates the prevalence of this in practice. In Edic terms, we know that jatis evidently developed from a range of social and ecological conditions over historical time. We can, however, see that one of the prime goals of this genre is the linking of the Veda with the actual conditions present in society at the time of the Shastra's composition. Since the ashrama of householder is the mandatory stage of life for all people, the Shastra ranks it as the vital foundation for society. The householder produces children, especially sons, who perpetuate the father's lineage. The twice-born householder also performs the Vedic rituals that sustain the universe and human society as well. Much of the Dharma Shastra is devoted to prescribing the ideal life for a householder. As the Shastra's authors do throughout, they especially address a male Brahmin audience. It's clear in Edic terms that Brahmins incorporated many of the most persuasive features of the rival Jain and Buddhist traditions. Among these was to regard non-violence highly. This contrasts with the earlier Vedic emphasis on the sacrifice of valued animals as food for the gods and ancestors. Instead, the Shastra forbids animal sacrifices and instead prescribes the offering of clarified butter called ghee, fruits, flowers, and other plant products. People dedicated their devotion to particular gods, especially Shiva or his family, or Vishnu or his incarnations. This made the puja more personal and less formulaic. Demeritorious bad karma is caused by any deviation from one's dharma, which is specific to a person's varna, jati, gender, stage of life, and family. Since some acts of violence could easily be incurred by living in the world, the Shastra provides three means of expiation of the negative effects of those acts. First, the person can cleanse him or herself. Depending on the type of bad karma, this might range from just washing with water to undergoing the most severe austerities, even causing one's own painful death. By such actions, the bad karma is burned off with no further consequences. Second, if the person does not do the expiation, then the king should punish him or her instead. The authors of the Dharma Shastra specify exemplary punishments that they consider appropriate for each varna, jati, gender, stage of life, family, and circumstance. Again, these range from a relatively mild fine to painful execution. Significantly, the exact punishment depends not only on the bad action, but also on the identity of the person who committed it and the identity of the victim, as well as where and when it was committed. As an example, a kshatriya who hurls abuse at a Brahmin should be fined 100 coins. But a Brahmin who defames a kshatriya should only be fined 50 coins, and only 12 coins if he verbally abuses a shudra. The location and time of day also matter. Therefore, the Shastra's authors assert that the ruler should consult a learned Brahmin advisor or empower a Brahmin as the judge in order to know and apply the specific dharma in each case. Third, if a person dies with bad karma unpurged, then the consequence will be a birth at a lower level. 
For instance, the authors of the Shastra declare that a Brahmin who drinks spiritus liquor enters the body of an insect, a bird, feeding on ordur, or a destructive beast. In Eddic analysis, this Brahmanic system explains and justifies the social hierarchy of Varnas and Jatis as a consequence of a person's own actions in a perceived, perceiving life. According to this Shastra, Brahmin men have earned and deserved their highest ritual status by having, in a previous birth, performed meritorious actions according to their Dharma. But this theory also gives people born lower hope that they will gain the reward of higher birth in the next life by conforming to their Dharma in their current one. As we'll see in future lectures, many reformers and oppressed people who were Hindus objected this model of Dharma-determined social inequality. Once a householder has secured his lineage, when his sons themselves have sons, he could voluntarily enter the next optional stage as a forest dweller, someone who has removed himself from the world. In this stage, he begins to withdraw his senses and his involvements with society. Women could also enter this stage of life, although the Shastra does not discuss their doing so very extensively. The authors of the Shastra thus give high respect to the way of life practiced by those Brahmins who entered retreats in the forest. In the Dharma Shastra, there is a final optional stage, one that leads directly toward moksha. This stage comes after one's symbolic cremation, a ritual that is symbolically ending one's social identity. In this final stage of life, one wanders homelessly without any family ties, eating only when fed, neither desiring life nor desiring death. These last two stages of life also conform in some degree to Jain and Buddhist models for monks and nuns. These are people who withdraw themselves from society in order to stop creating bad karma and thereby move toward nirvana. These Shastric teachers' teachings also mean that someone could remain within the widespread Hindu tradition and respect the long sacred Veda while still incorporating many of the most powerful aspects of the rival Jain and Buddhist traditions. Other, more focused Shastras address other aspects of life and particular audiences. Let's turn now to the Arta Shastra dealing with the second highest ranked path of material power and wealth. While Brahmins claim precedent in ritual terms during this post-Vedic period, kings and merchants had been rising up. Most of the support for Jainism and Buddhism came from those rising classes. So some Brahmins compiled the Arthashastra to address the concerns and dharma of those classes in particular. Credit for this text later went to a Brahmin, Chanakya of the Kautilya clan, who had reportedly masterminded the rise of the first Mauryan Empire around 320 BCE. But internal evidence indicates that the most prominent version of the Arthashastra was compiled hundreds of years after Chanakya's death. As we've discussed in the lecture on the origins of the Mauryan Empire, Eddic historians have found unique source material about that empire in this Shastra. The Arthashastra focuses mostly on the role of the king, but this Shastra also provides, it, provides rich evidence about how its authors envisioned the households of the expanding middle and upper classes, especially those living in the burgeoning cities of that post-Vedic era. For example, this Shastra prescribes the highest ranked type of wedding as one in which the bride's parents give a dowry, including jewelry. Unlike dowry customs in India today, in this Shastra, the bride retained much authority and control over that wealth. Should her husband not provide for her maintenance, the wife could use that dowry as long as she does so appropriately and morally. Only in extreme circumstances could her husband make use of the dowry. Even then, he has to repay it to his wife with interest or else be judged a thief. Further, should the husband be immoral, incapable, or stay too many years abroad, she could divorce him. A husband could only take a second wife under specific conditions, 
including if his first wife had not produced a son during the first eight years of marriage. But there are also limits set by the Shastra about the extent that a woman could move about in public without incurring a fine from the state. Thus, while women still stood behind men, they had more rights accorded them in this Shastra and probably in ancient Indian society than they did in many societies on other continents at that ancient time. In addition, the Arta Shastra highlights many other features of society. Much of the text is prescriptive, but it also suggests descriptive evidence. Slavery clearly existed, but it was not the chattel slavery of the pre-Civil War Americas. Rather, lower-born people might become debt slaves, but then they must be freed on the payment of that debt, either by relatives or by their own earnings. If a master abuses a slave, for example, making him or her do jobs that would be ritually polluting or offending the chastity of a female slave, then that slave is immediately free. Nor are children born into slavery. This Shastra also prescribes that the government should supervise and regulate labor relations. Both employers and employees have to fulfill their contract or else the state should intervene. Artisans and merchants participate in guilds which set wages, prices, and working conditions. This Shastra also lays out regulations about specific products and services. For example, how much color fading could a washerman cause without being fined? And when are physicians subject to fines for malpractice? Even if the exact details of the Shastra were not enforced or prevalent, they provide Eddic historians with a fascinating body of evidence about how Brahmin scholars and teachers at that time thought about the everyday aspects of society. The third major Shastra also deals with key parts of society. This is the Kama Shastra, sometimes known as the Kama Sutra, from sutra meaning pithy tenets. Kama means the pleasurable relationship between the material world and a person as experienced through the senses. While this Shastra claims karma can be at a legitimate path to moksha, at least for particular classes of people, the Shastra itself recognizes that this path generally ranks below dharma and artha. Kama can also be quite dangerous if its true purpose is forgotten. Here, as with the other two paths to moksha, the goal is to perform masterfully the duties appropriate to one's social identity, but with total non-attachment. The Kama Shastra addresses a more limited audience. It specifies that young urban men and women should study its teachings for a cultivated life of pleasure. But courtesans are the special focus, since their livelihood depends on their mastery of its principles and practices. Who better than a courtesan to take material profit from the desires of men without themselves being enmeshed in love? For a courtesan, or indeed any woman, the Shastra prescribes training and mastery of the classical 64 arts. These include a vast range of expertise from singing, playing a variety of instruments, gymnastics and magic, to cooking, carpentry, architecture and chemistry. These arts will enable any unmarried, widowed or divorced woman to support herself economically. Other parts of this Shastra detail the arts of seduction, titillation of one's partner, and the ideal types of kissing, touching, and sexual intercourse. These last sections have attracted much international attention to this Shastra, but there are also many misconceptions about it. As with all Shastras, the purpose of the Kama Shastra is to enable a devoted and dispassionate practitioner of its sciences, someone who is in complete control over the senses, to achieve moksha, never to be born again. From the time of the composition of these Shastras until today, substantial numbers of Hindu Indian people have found these Brahmanic models convincing. But Hindus were not the only religious community that made India its home. My next lecture will show the various ways that the Zoroastrian, Jewish, and Christian religions and people came to ancient India, 
and how they interacted with the Indian cultures and people already living there.